for Good Morning Park, and glad to have you here with us this week. So glad you joined us online. There's so many churches out there online that it's honestly hard to choose sometimes which one to go to, which one to visit, which one to fellowship with, but I'm glad you've chosen to join us. Hey, this week we're doing Lord's Supper, so I invite you to get yourself a piece of bread or a cracker or something, uh, and some juice or some water or heck, even some wine to uh, to join us in, in, in communion this morning. David this week is talking about being complete in Christ. This is part one of a two-part message. And so I invite you to turn your Bibles with us as we as we uh, read scripture this morning. I invite you to join us. Chat with us online. Let us know you're here. I'm glad to see you. I'm glad to hear you. Join us now as we worship. through joy, through pain, through sorrow, through 
through wellness, Christ should lead us through every part of our lives. So let's stand this morning and let's worship.
Baby 
I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God. we do believe we believe that it's you that rose again but before that you died on the cross for our sins and you rose again that we may have eternal life father because we believe we're able to then spread that message to the world and I pray that each of us are able to do that, Lord. And as we continue to worship this morning, I just pray that we, we keep that belief in mind that you are our Savior. That you are the one that came to save us, Lord. Father, I thank you for all that you are and for everything that you do. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Children's Church is dismissed. In church, you may be seated.
Day is a time that we as a nation set aside to remember, to honor, to pay tribute to those men and women who gave their all for our, our nation. We, we stop to celebrate their sacrifice. And today, that is exactly what we are doing regarding Jesus. This is a memorial celebration because Jesus went to the cross and died on our behalf, we, we honor him. We celebrate what he did for us. And so um, that, that is why if you're a follower of Christ, then you should be excited and welcome this opportunity to, to honor him. And, you know, and that's why it's not necessarily appropriate to do it if you are not a follower of Christ, to to. You know, memorialize someone that, that you don't follow would, would not make sense. So I just want you to understand that and, and, and have that fresh in your mind that this is an opportunity to, to celebrate what Jesus did for us. And Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and the church at Corinth was struggling. And one of the things they struggled with was how to properly do the Lord's Supper. And so Paul wrote to them and said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Life can be heavy, a burden which at times seems unbearable. It's easy to find ourselves overwhelmed, weighed down, or even crushed. Often these struggles come and go, a nuisance, an annoyance. Yet sometimes they grab a hold, gripping every aspect of our lives, pulling us down, consuming our hope. It's hard to breathe under the weight of our anxieties. It's difficult to move forward when we're anchored to our worries. But God loves us too much to let us stay this way. He wants to replace our anxiety with hope, our fear with courage, our worries with peace, and our burdens with freedom. In moments when life begins to weigh you down, remember this one simple truth. We serve a faithful God, a God who's offered to carry our burdens and asks us to cast all our cares on Him. begin by reading from Colossians chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. And I do this just so that kind of the, the context is, is fresh in our minds. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit, 
according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the, the, <clears throat> by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This, is, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now this is Paul writing to the church at Colossians. And what Paul is doing is he's trying to help them understand that they don't need extra stuff added to their salvation. Uh, the, the whole point of this message today is for us to understand that when Jesus saves you, he completely saves. He doesn't just partially save us. And Paul begins by warning them not to be deceived. And, and this is a critical piece that, that there is all sorts of ways that, w that people can be deceived and led astray. Uh, back, uh, Thomas Edison was a, a very, he liked to smoke cigars, okay? He loved to smoke cigars. And his favorite were Havana cigars. And he got really frustrated because people would come to visit him and they'd load up on his good Havana cigars. And so he got the bright idea that he was going to order some cigars made out of cabbage leaves. And his plan was to set those out so that people that came in and helped themselves to cigars would be smoking his cabbage leaf cigars instead of his good Havanas. Well, he, he begins with that. And after a period of time, he noticed that his Havana cigars were still getting used up. And he, he asked his assistant, he said, what happened to those cabbage cigars that I ordered? And the, the assistant says, well, I didn't realize that those were cabbage when they came in. I thought they were some of your, your cigars. And so those are the ones that you took with you on your last trip. He had smoked them and didn't even realize that he was smoking cabbage instead of his Havanas. Now, we can be deceived. There, there's another uh, interesting story. Back in the year 1212... So it's, it's been a day or two since this happened. But if, if you paid attention during your, your middle school and high school history, you probably learned about the Crusades. And in 1212, there was what was known as the Children's Crusade. And what happened was there was this shepherd boy in France. And he believed that Jesus came to him and told him, to lead a crusade of children to the Holy Lands. And his thought was that children are innocent. And so as a result, through their innocence and through their humility, they would overcome the, the evil Muslims that had taken over the, the Holy Lands and that they, would, that they would conquer through their innocence and through their humility. And so this boy began his pilgrimage of heading down to Italy where he could uh, be blessed by the Pope and that his, his followers would all be blessed 
and then they would launch out and go to the Holy Lands. On the way, children by the thousands began to follow him. And by the time they made it down to the Mediterranean to, to launch out, there were literally tens of thousands of children. And they received a blessing from the Pope. And this boy had been saying that God would part the waters just like he did for the children of Israel. And that they, they would walk across on dry land across the Mediterranean and be able to go right into Jerusalem. Well, that didn't happen. And so here they are on the edge of the ocean wondering what to do. Well, a couple of sailors or a couple of ship captains come up to them and say, we have the solution. We believe in you so much, we will haul you and all of these thousands of children to the Holy Lands. We won't charge you a thing. We'll just do it as our service to God. And so believing that that was their answer to prayer, these thousands of children load onto the ships. But instead of taking them to the Holy Lands, they instead took them to North Africa and sold them into slavery. Every last one of them. Most of them never made it home again. That was the last they were ever heard of. They were deceived. Now, this morning, as we talk about this, isn't that an uplifting story? Um, this morning, and it's true, by the way. I mean, that's not, that's not made up. As we look at this this morning, Paul is wanting these people to understand that their salvation is complete in Christ. One of the things that happens is people think, well, do I need to do something else? You know, I, I, I want Jesus in my life, but do I need to do something else? Do I, do I need to add to this? Well, what we need to hear and what we need to understand is that our salvation is complete in Jesus Christ. We don't need Jesus plus anything. Jesus and Jesus alone. When you take humanity at our best, if you take the, the, the epitome of who we are and what we think and what we understand, and you hold that up next to God, we fall short. We will always fall short because we are not on God's level. God's wisdom is greater than, than the sum of us all put together. In Romans chapter 1, it says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas on what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. Now, it's not necessary that we go through and pick out any philosophy or this philosophy or that philosophy and then point out why it's false or, or why it doesn't measure up to God. All we need to do is as we go through life, when you hear someone bringing up an, an idea or bringing up this is how it ought to be, all you have to do is listen to what they say, compare it to what the Bible teaches, and if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it's garbage. Throw it out. It doesn't matter what it is, and it doesn't matter how lofty or, or great the, the person pushing it seems to think that it is. Paul here is, atta is attacking false teaching. He's, he's saying the philosophies that are, are being presented to you are nonsense. You don't need Jesus plus something else. 
And in the midst of that, Paul begins to, to just proclaim Christ and, and hold Christ up as, as, the, as the model, as, as the standard. This is all we need. Now, when Jesus saves, he saves completely. And what I want to do just real quickly is for us to understand by looking at when Jesus performed miracles, he performed miracles completely. Um, it, I'm just going to take a, a few from the book of Matthew. In Matthew 9.22, it says, Jesus turned around and seeing her, this is the woman who had the issue of blood. And he says, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. In Matthew 12, 13, it says, Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. In Matthew 15, 28, Then Jesus said, answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. In Matthew 15, 31, the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Now, the, the word that is used consistently through those scriptures is the word where we get the, the word hygiene from. And the way it's translated, what it means is entirely well. And this is what we need to understand, that when Jesus healed, he healed completely. When someone was blind and Jesus healed them, they didn't get their sight back a little bit better. They got it back perfectly. When someone was paralyzed, they didn't get mostly healed. They got completely healed. And so that's, that's what I'm wanting us to understand, that when God does something... He does it completely. Now, in Colossians 2, if you're saying, well, what exactly does that, that have to do here? Well, what that means is that when Jesus saves us, he doesn't sort of save us. He completely saves us. In chapter 2, verse 10, it says, you have been filled in him. Or another way of understanding it, you are complete in him. Just as Jesus did complete miracles of healing, he also does a complete healing of our souls. You know, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Uh, when David cried out in Psalm 51, after he had committed um, adultery with Bathsheba, he comes to God and remember he says, Create in me a clean heart, O Lord. You know, he, he doesn't say, well, God, I, I, you know, I, I'm feeling really bad about this. Would you, would you help me feel a little bit better? No, he wants, he wants cleansing. He wants cleanness. So in Colossians 2, it says, you have been filled in him who is the head and rule uh, and authority. You know, we, we are healed spiritually completely in him. Now, Paul is going to show us from this point forward three different ways in which we are complete in Christ. The first thing, and this is what I'm going to spend just today on this, that our salvation is complete in Jesus. And then next Sunday, we're going to look at how we are completely forgiven by Jesus. One of the things that people struggle with is that they don't feel forgiven. And so I'm going to help us next week look at how we have complete forgiveness and how we have complete victory in Jesus. Now, in verse 11 and 12, it says, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made of hands, by putting um, it, with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh. By the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. Now, what Paul is saying is, is that your, 
Your salvation is complete. You don't have to do something else. Part of the heresy that was being pushed at the, the Corinthian church was that, well, yes, you've been saved, but you still need to do all of the things that Judaism requires, including being circumcised. And they were, there was this, this push that you had to go through all of the rituals of Judaism in order to be made right with God, and that there were these other pagan philosophies that were being pushed. And so Paul is, is pushing back against that. And, and he's saying, you have been circumcised. You were made, you were circumcised, but with a circumcision not made by hands. In other words, it's a spiritual issue. We need to understand that salvation isn't something that we do physically. It's something that is done spiritually. And, and so Paul is talking about a circumcision made without hands. So what, what's going on here? Every little Hebrew boy at, uh, on the eighth day of life would have been circumcised. And the whole picture of that was that this is how you identify as being a, a child of, of Israel, that, that you are a, a fit, you know, through this physical act. And by the way, this is where infant baptism gets its same kind of groundwork, that um, somehow the idea that if you do something to this baby, that it carries over and becomes a... a way of, of saving or a way of protecting or a way of guiding. And we understand, you know, that's nonsense. There is no salvation through doing some physical act. It, it's, a, it's a spiritual issue. And so the, the thought had developed over time among the Israelites that, well, We've been circumcised, and so that's all we need to do. We can, we can live however we want because, well, hey, we're in. We're in tight. We're good. And, and that's, that's obviously wrong thinking. So Paul is saying, you have been circumcised, but it's a spiritual circumcision, something that was done without hands. So what... What we need to understand and what Paul is communicating, I'm going to read verse 11 in the New International Version. It says, In him you were circumcised in the putting off of your sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. When you became a Christian, when you become a Christian, your old nature is taken away. It is cut away. Only Christ can do that. Nobody else. And, and if you're sitting there and you're not completely asleep yet, then what, you can, what you're probably thinking is, well, if that's true, then how come I'm still sinning? If my sin nature was cut away, if it's been taken from me, why do I still sin? And I think that that's a, that's a legit question. Because we have a new nature, but we still have an old body. When I was in college, I had a friend who had this old beater car. Uh, I mean, the thing was just garbage. It, it, it barely could run whatsoever. I think he paid like $300 to buy the car. But then he went out and put a $700 stereo system in it. OK, he had this old beater car with a phenomenal stereo system. All right. Um, hey, teenagers, what do you expect? That's us. We still are in an old beater body. All right. We we are in a junky body that is afflicted with sin. But we have a new nature. And this is what we need to understand. Paul explains it in Romans 7. He says, I don't understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. 
Now, does that sound familiar? It, that sounds like he's describing me. And then he goes on, he says, now if I do what I don't want, I agree with the law and that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So he's saying, my new nature wants to obey God. My new nature wants to be in fellowship with God. My new nature wants to please God. My new nature loves God and, and wants to, to be connected to him. But dagnabbit, I still do stuff that I hate. And so it's not my new nature that's doing it. It's my old flesh that is still hanging around. It's a different principle. In verse 20, he says, If I do what I don't want, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. And, and then in verse 23, But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So this, this paints the picture. We are... We, if, if you are in Christ, you should want to please God. You should want to live for God. You should desire God. But you also recognize how, how frustrating it is because you still sin. And Paul sums it up in verse 24. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he gives us the answer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So my new nature is Godward. It, it wants God, but my body still serves sin. And it's going to be that way until Jesus returns or, or I die. And that's true for each and every one of us. When you receive Christ, your old nature dies. It's cut away with a circumcision not made of hands. And so Paul is saying you don't need to be more saved. You don't, you don't need something else. You know, it's like saying I'm married and now I'm more married. No, you're, you're just married. Or I'm pregnant and now I'm more pregnant. That doesn't happen. You know, you either are or you aren't. And you're either saved or you're not saved. <clears throat> I should swallow occasionally. <laughs> Paul learned how to live in this, in this oppositional way. And, and he tells it to us in Romans chapter 8. He learned that you walk in the spirit. That you have... You have a desire to please God, and so you learn to walk in a way that pleases God. You're, you learn to obey the Spirit. In verse 12, the, I'm back in Colossians now, he says, Having been buried with him in baptism. So what this is telling us is that Paul is teaching that we are saved by Christ. And baptism is the picture of that. Now, some people have wrongly read this and thought, well, Paul's saying that you get saved by baptism. Absolutely not. Why would Paul tell us you don't need to get circumcised anymore, but now you have to get baptized? He's not going to replace one ceremony with another ceremony. That, that's, that's absolute nonsense. This is speaking spiritually again. What he's saying is that when, when Christ died, he died holding on to your sin. When he was buried, he was buried with your sin, with my sin. And then when he rose from the dead, our sins were left behind. And that's what the picture of, of water baptism is all about. It is the picture of you are here, you were buried, and then you were risen in new life. That's the whole image. That's the whole picture of baptism. And once again, that's why sprinkling doesn't get baptism. That, that's, not, that's not a picture of baptism. 
Baptism is you were buried to your old way of life and you're raised in, in new life. Water baptism is a picture of the salvation that takes place. You died, you rose again, it's in new life. You know, just as God raised Jesus, he raised you. When you were saved, you were saved completely. You weren't saved partially and you still have other things that you have to accomplish. You know, and, and what we need to understand also is there's really just two options. I, I started to look like Richard Nixon here. Now, you, you know, when you are saved, you have, you know, as a human being, there are only two options. You are either dead or you are alive in Christ. There isn't a third option. I know Oprah Winfrey likes to say there are many ways to get to God, but she's wrong. There's one way and one way only, Jesus Christ. And so when God raised Jesus, if your sins were accounted to Jesus, then when Jesus rose from the dead, he rose with you as well. And if you are not a follower of Christ, you are still holding on to your sin. When you stand before God, God's going to say, you're still holding your sin. You've, you are going to be punished for your sin. And what is that? That is a place called hell. We need to understand that. You know, if you believe in God and you believe that Jesus, when he went to the cross, took the sin of, of each and every person on him, and that he died with our sin. And he was buried for three days. And at the end of three days, he rose from the dead. If you believe that, that's what salvation, where salvation takes place. Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So we, that's salvation. That is the only means of salvation. In Romans 6, 3, it says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And again, this is the spiritual baptism you know, again, you do not get saved by being dunked in water. You get saved by believing that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and believing that he was buried and after three days he rose from the dead. That's salvation. There is no other. Now, this is, this is what Paul is, is helping the Colossian church to understand. We can only die once for our sin, just once. In, um, in verse 9, it says, Christ was raised from death, and we know that he cannot die again. Death has no power over him. This is what we need to understand. Jesus died once. You and I are going to die once, physically speaking. Now, spiritually speaking... There is what is known in Revelation as the second death. And the people who suffer the second death will be the ones that are still holding on to their sin. So this, this is so important for us to get. You're saved. If you have committed your life to Christ, if you understand who Christ is and what he did for you and you believe that, and you have committed your life to follow him, you're saved. You can't become unsaved. You can't mess up and God say, well, doggone it, I'm going to have to send Jesus back to the cross again so that you can get saved again because you keep messing up. You're saved once and only. We can't unsave ourselves. We can't mess up because we didn't do anything to make it happen. Jesus did it for us. 
Our only job, our only responsibility is to believe that Jesus did it and to basically stake our life on it. From this point forward, my life is committed to Christ because he died and he rose again. And I believe God did that. Now, can you mess up? Yes, you can mess up terribly. I have. I have done things that if you knew what I had done, you'd probably say, I'm not going to that church anymore. I, I'm, I'm serious. I, I am not a good person in my flesh. But I know neither are you. And so <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm among friends. <laughs> what we need to understand is that Jesus died he died once and for all. Your job, your responsibility is to believe and to obey. Period. Move forward and it's done. It's complete. The old nature is dead. It just hadn't hit the ground yet. Okay? You, you know, you, you, are, you are a walking dead body that's housed with a new life. You're an old clunker car with a brand new stereo system inside. You know, that, that's each of us. That describes us. Your old clunker body is going to continue to break. It's going to continue to do bad things. It's going to continue to sin. Your responsibility is to obey Christ. When you were saved, you were given the ability to obey Christ. But it takes practice and it takes training and it takes discipline to walk in faith with Christ. And as you do that, God will guide you each and every step of the way. So when someone comes along and says, well, yeah, I, I know you're saved, but you need to get baptized in our baptistry. You need to... Do this. You need to obey the Ten Commandments to the letter of the law. You need to do this or you need to say, no, I am saved because of what Christ did, not because I'm doing stuff. Today, you know, we're, we're just looking at the fact that our salvation is complete in Christ. Next time, we'll look at how our forgiveness is complete in Christ and how our victory is given to us in Christ. Let's pray. Father, it's all about you. Everything is about you. It's not about us. It's about you. What you have done, how you have set us free, how you have given us everything we need for salvation. And my prayer is that now as we as we are here at this moment of truth, I pray that you will help each and every person here to honestly look at their hearts and ask, have I committed my life to Christ based on what he has done? Or am I thinking that my salvation is somehow based on what I have done? And God, for those who are thinking that their salvation is somehow based on what they have done, Please set them straight. Please let the Holy Spirit speak to them clearly. Help them to, to hear and understand the truth. God, we have no hope apart from you. We have no hope apart from Jesus. And so my prayer is that you will help each and every one of us to honestly look into our hearts and to know the truth of our condition before you. And I pray this to your glory and in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand.
Christ and she comes to be baptized and so um, if you celebrate with me that she has done that um, then please say amen. amen. I, I'm so excited you know what a, what a blessing you know God is good to us and I, I hope that each and That, that you've committed your life to Christ. If you haven't, uh, just understand that you're, you're in a bad way um, before God. And that if you were to stand before him, it would not go well. And so please, please hear that with a, a, a heart of love for you. Because it, the Bible says it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should have eternal life. So let's go ahead and, and be dismissed. I'm going to ask Lexi to stand up here. I'm sure she's excited about that. And just come by and, and love on her and let her know that you will pray for her and support her. Let's go ahead and, and, and close in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. And most of all, thank you for the gift of salvation. You are so good to us. Um, again, not a one of us deserve the kindness and the love and the mercy that you show us and yet you do it because you're God and, and you love. Thank you. And I just pray that as we move forward from this day, you will um, just continue to work in, in Lexi's life and that you would draw her consistently and steadily toward yourself. But also, Father, I just I pray that you would do that for each and every one of us, that we would turn our lives over to you in a way that honors you and glorifies you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just <laughs> muted.